we go, recording to the cloud now. Welcome everyone, I'm Lisa Austin, Director of the Edinburgh University Bruce Gallery here on the campus of Edinburgh in the Northwestern corner of Pennsylvania, where we're celebrating our 100th anniversary as an art program. Edinburgh is located two hours from three major cities. We're north of Pittsburgh, east of Buffalo, and west of Cleveland. Our university has three essential characteristics, a lot of snow, fantastic bagpipers, and an amazing art program. Tonight's 60 minute event is free and open to the public thanks to the generosity of the university, the department, the Student Government Association, and Erie Arts and Culture. We are recording this and we'll post the link at brucegallery.info. This Zoom is a part of a series organized by the independent curator, Kololo Luckett. The title of this series is Illuminating the Collection. What collection, you might ask? Bruce Gallery's Permanent Collection. The Permanent Collection was started about 70 years ago. My guess is that the art faculty back then recognized that if Edinburgh wanted to have a strong program, then with, we, uh, they recognized that we didn't have a major art museum close by. So the faculty had to find a way to bring great artworks here to Edinburgh for students to see the works firsthand. The collection includes a few objects in clay, wood, fiber, and bronze, along with photographs, posters, drawings, paintings, and collages. But the majority of the work are prints, lithographs, woodcuts, silk screens, and etchings spanning three centuries. We have prints by Albers, Cezanne, Kalowitz, Picasso, Warhol, and hundreds of others, including contemporary visiting artists at Loveland Hall's Egress Press. A few of the works in the collection are by faculty members and alumni, and tonight we'll be looking at work by some of Edinburgh's own. And now I'm turning the program over to our organizer and moderator, Kololo Luckett. All right, thank you, Lisa, and good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome. So I just wanted to give some housekeeping here before we start. Um, as we go along, feel free to, um, in the chat section, pose any questions or comments, um, and then I will um, facilitate those questions and comments the best I can, uh, and um, we'll just have some We'll have some fun this evening. So I also wanted to let people know about the format. What we're gonna do is first, um, we will have uh, Rachel uh, pro uh, provide, show us two works that Patricia Bellengillen um, has created that is part of the permanent collection of uh, Edinburgh, just to give some people some context of her work, which was in the past, but then we will then have uh, Pat then go through and give us a wonderful presentation about her work and what she's currently working on. And then she's gonna show us uh, a little bit of uh, some past work from her time at Edinburgh. And then we're gonna transition to Rachel who is um, pursuing her graduate degree, her master's uh, in sculpture at Edinburgh. And she's gonna um, provide a little bit about her work and then we're gonna be in conversation. So this is informal, but this is a structured uh, event. All right, so um, I just want to welcome everybody and then also introduce formally uh, Pat to Rachel, who is going to be uh, showing your work that's on view at the university. Um, and you've met Lisa, and I just wanted to formally do that as well. So, okay. All right, Rachel, do you want to, let's, let's. Do you want to unmute yourself? You can. Yes. And then, and, and, and Pat, uh, as Rachel's showing these two works, uh, if your memory, you know, serves you correctly, <laughs> if you wanted to share a little bit about these beautiful works that you, um, that are in the collection. And also Lisa, feel free to, um, you know, comment on them as well. Well, I'd just like to start with one comment and say that Rachel is actually in the Bruce Gallery right now with the actual prints from the collection. And I know that uh, Anthony Ferris is a graduate student in the uh, print program oh. here. And uh, Professor William Mathy, who's involved with the Egress Press today, has just joined us. So welcome. 
So is this a trip? Uh, is, is this a, a, a trip down memory lane for you? Well, it is um, for, for several reasons. I made the prints with John Lysak, who started Egress Press. I think John retired maybe about three or four years ago. Uh, he retired young, but uh, not only was he an Edinburgh professor, John was one of the first graduate students that I worked with um, when I was teaching at Carnegie Mellon. And John came uh, to Carnegie Mellon with a vast amount of skill and experience, uh, not only as an artist, but he worked for several presses in uh, the Seattle area. So the first one, um, the goat, uh, that was the first one that we did together. And it, it, that alone was a um, trip down memory lane because it was done, uh, the key image was done on a stone that still had traces of an image that I had done at Edinburgh, maybe maybe at that time, like 30 years uh, prior to it. So there, I, we got to grind off my own image to make that. So very simply, it was a multicolored um, lithograph. I think there's one run of silk screen. Uh, we included, I think Franz Spohn was teaching at Edinburgh at the time. Uh, and that sort of rainbow bleed that goes over the ground on the goat um, it is a silk screen. And we had always intended to do one final run to kind of blot out the whiteness of the background, but we just, we didn't, we didn't have time to do that and we thought it could stand as it is. And, you know, like the work that I'm talking, you know, that I will be talking about and addressing today, I, the goat, I, I'm not sure if that has a name on it, but I think it um, may be called scapegoat um, and referring to the, the Hebrew religious symbolism of, of the goat as a, scape, um, as a symbol of something that accepts the sins of others and clears the, skins of, the sins of others. The other small piece, which I can't for the life of me remember the name, but I did it a slightly later date. And this was when John was really um, setting up um, more of a photographic, um, the equipment um, to do uh, CYMK images on aluminum plates. And he brought me back up and taught me the basics of Photoshop. And um, we made this four color split print. And it starts with the same thing. And then one of the things we decided to do was photograph the background. Uh, we had the key image from the goat of all of the flowers, uh, the talking and grimacing flowers. Uh, and we reused that, that made up the goat and we reused those as the background for this bear piece. Uh, so that's a little bit of the background. I think it may not be in the, there are what maybe one or two of my drawings floating around Edinburgh too. I think uh, the, the library bought one, at, you know, a zillion years ago. So I was kind of surprised to see these, but I'll just give a shout out. I think Egress Press was just a wonderful, wonderful organization. I'm glad that, that it's still going, so. Wonderful, thank you so much, Pat. So uh, before we go into your presentation, I just wanna give a little background about Pat. I know a lot of people are familiar with you, but I just wanna um, give a little bit about your background to share a little bit, because it's, you know, you have made, you know, tremendous accolades in your work as an artist and also as a professor. So Patricia Bell and Gillen lives and works in rural West, Western Pennsylvania. She recently retired from Carnegie Mellon University after 29 years as a professor in the School of Art where she held the Dorothy L. Stubnitz uh, Endowed Chair in Art. The university honored her with the Ryan Award for uh, her teaching in 2000. In, in 2000. Uh, pa Patricia's paintings, prints, and drawings have been the focus of over 50 solo exhibitions including venues in Washington, D.C., Nashville, Tennessee, uh, La Cruces, New Mexico, Albany, New York, Bloomington, Illinois, Portland, Oregon, Grand Rapids, Michigan, New Zealand, and uh, London, and many others. 
Her work has been included in numerous group shows in museums, commercial galleries, university galleries, and alternative spaces. Uh, I, I could go on and on about your work, Pat, but I just love the opportunity to be able to work with you and learn more about your work. Also during the pandemic, I feel like it has provided such a wonderful opportunity to, for me to get to know other artists working in the field and working with other arts administrators um, and other institutions like Edinburgh. And so this has just been a tremendous honor for me, uh, especially during the pandemic to uh, widen my uh, networks and be able to um, facilitate tonight's uh, program. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and we are going to take the next about 15 minutes or so uh, and have uh, uh, Pat uh, walk us through some of her work. All right, so let me share my screen. And here we go. All right, can everybody see this? Oh, I'm over there. Okay. Um, I guess that's my cue to go and you can cut me off uh, if I go over time. So um, I guess it's easier to do that on Zoom than in real life. So um, after too many lectures that I've given about my own work to even remember or uh, note here, I still feel self-conscious speaking about my work. Um, I like to speak about it, but it, there's a bit of self-consciousness. And I, I always think of uh, Joseph Campbell, his, you know, he's one of my heroes. Uh, the, he's a philosopher, you know, the protector of our myths. And he once said, and I'm paraphrasing here, the artist who tells you what their work means or what their work is about insults you. What, that ha what happens there is the artist denies the viewer the opportunity for self-reflection and denies the opportunity of getting in touch with one's own memories and, and self and unconscious thoughts. So because we're here for education, um, I'm gonna insult you a little bit and I'm gonna tell you what I think my work's about. Um, I think my artist statement, uh, kind of concisely describes my work and what I'm, what my goals are uh, and, and what I'm doing. No one ever calls me and now I'm getting a call. Um, I'm gonna read my artist statement. So uh, I think it gives a nice umbrella um, idea of what I'm doing now um, and mostly about how I generate the imagery in the, in the work. Um, so if you'll bear with me while I read. Um, disorderly notions. Thank you. Uh, somewhere in my brain, personal narrative mixes with fairy tales. Historical events intertwine with the imagined and a veil of nostalgia blurs the border between fact and fiction. Symbolic imagery moves about in the temporal lobe with cartoon characters and recent news flashes picked from the internet join the sagas of black and white television. My drawings and mixed media works use these bits and pieces of visual history, the stones and bones of memory to suggest a narrative and remix our stories. These disorderly notions are employed in an, an attempt to engage the viewer's associative responses and to jar the forgotten memories and the senses of wonder and wondering that lay quietly below the surface. The sounds as well as the meanings of words move me. After years of studying cultural dream, mythological and religious symbols, I believe that the most important signs are the images that appear and keep pressing on one's mind with no explanation. Unexpected but oddly recognized uh, visions that flash across the brain when words and phrases like phantom limb, history and legend, or separation of church and state are heard, or the nation uh, compositions that, appeared while that appear while revisiting the pages of vintage mad magazines, or hearing the refrain da 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 from the old Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Honoring these, public, these puzzling visages maps the directions that I follow in my work today. 
My work combines ideas and imagery generated through study and research with ideas and imagery that are felt intuitive and en enigmatic. The work also celebrates the fundamental act of drawing. I welcome provocation and puzzles. I would like my work to confront the viewer simultaneously with beauty and awkwardness and to mediate grace with humor. I want to achieve a weird elegance. I stole the phrase um, disorderly notions uh, from Cervantes uh, in his, he describes Don Quixote, a world of disorderly notions picked out of his books crowded into his imagination. I love that a quote from 1605 helps me to think about my work and describe my work and my process of making it. It was also claimed that Cervantes denied that he wrote Don Quixote and a critic said that he was a party to his own fiction. So I, I consider myself a party to my own fictions. So we can get, okay. Um, most of the work that I'm going to show you, I should say all of the work except this piece, um, uh, all of the pieces were completed within the last 18 to 24 months. But I wanted to start with this piece from 2016 um, because it sort of moved me into a slightly new direction. And the elements that I worked with there um, kind of follow through uh, the, the work that I'll be showing you that I've just uh, completed. Um, the main um, imagery um, in this piece consists of, of cartouches. And those are the big circular images that run across the three big panels. Um, I lost myself, I am clinging to notes here. Um, this is where, where this first came into, into be. And like a lot of my work, it's sort of this strange confluence of things that happen in my life, something I'm reading or something that I heard. Um, I was browsing through architectural renderings and came across the name Cartouche. I liked the sound of it. So um, I looked up the meanings and I was really taken by the three very different meanings, but sort of come together to describe this body of work. A cartouche is a graphic um, or architectural de device uh, that is similar to a frame and it's uh, there to denote something important or of historical significance. Two, it's a container that holds weapons uh, or ammunition. Um, and three, if you are familiar with uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, a lozen, it's the lozen shape, um, the lozenger shape that holds together a group of symbols, uh, like you know, you'll see the eagle, uh, maybe a lion uh, or a face. And that, that little insert where it encircles those, it either denotes a name or a phrase. And I love this idea that something could be words, a weapon, uh, or something of importance all at the same time. Um, coincidentally, I was listening to an audio book um, about uh, survival on the ice. And that's not a coincidence. I listened to tons of audio books, but this one, um, oh, can I change the slides? Um, this one, um, uh, I'm gonna go back, <laughs> that's okay. Um, the audio book was uh, Kingdom of Ice and it was a survival story um, about people that had wrecked, uh, they went to save uh, boats that had been iced in in the Arctic around 1820. And they kept describing um, the open polar sea. And the open polar sea was almost like a hoax um, that it was responsible for the deaths of a lot of people. There was a, one of the most brilliant and respected map, uh, map makers of the time uh, believed that if you go to the Arctic and there's just this thin uh, ring of ice, and if you break through that thin uh, ring of ice, you'll come into a tropical sea with, complete with palm trees and warm water. Um, and, and I loved that imagery. And I actually loved how the words uh, the open polar sea sounded. It sounded very poetic to me. But at the same time, and because of those words and because of that belief, 
many people died trying to go across the Arctic to find a cheaper passage uh, to the goods of, of uh, China and Japan. Um, and there was no polar sea. Um, so the pieces here, this first piece is called uh, Blind Spots, Cruel Poetics. And uh, there were, I started thinking about other words that could be used as weapons or words that could hurt. And the first panel is um, in the center of the white circle, the big white glowing circle uh, says the heliocentric universe. And that's a phrase that I loved, but we forget that Galileo was put under house arrest and many people were put to uh, death at the stake, burned at the stake for believing or teaching about that the sun was the center of the universe. Uh, the center panel says the open polar sea. And the third panel uh, is the cruel poetics of the, I love hearing it in French, but I won't even attempt to say it in French, but it's les pantalones rouges and the red pants. And the red pants were part of the uniform uh, that the um, French army wore during World War I. And the French government would not let them change those red pants because they, that was France. So a lot of people died because of those uh, French, those pantalones rouge. Um, these pieces are done, I'll go a little technical from time to time, but this will sum up a lot of the following pieces. I, the, the panels you can see are 115 inches high by 82 inches wide. Uh, they're on birch plywood. I usually use birch, but you know, sometimes whatever looks best at Lowe's that week, the quality changes from time to time. So maple and oak I'll work on from time to time. I, to prepare the, uh, the panels to draw on, I coat them with uh, on the back and on the front with layers of high quality house paint. Um, I don't like gesso, but the house paint is cheaper. Even if I use premium, um, it's cheaper than gesso and it doesn't have that rubbery sense that, um, I, that gesso has. After the panels are coated, I do layers of washes and the washes are very thin down um, acrylic paints and they're poured on, let dry. If it's a warm day, I do them outside um, so they can dry faster. And I started doing the washes because I realized when I made prints, I, I really love the touche washes of prints and I trusted myself to using texture um, more than when I was just uh, drawing straight on, on like, you know, pure white panels or just tone panels. Um, the drawings then go over top of the, um, the washes and I use oil-based um, pencils, colored pencils. I think they're made by uh, Faber-Castell and I like them a lot better than uh, doing a uh, selling a product here. I like them better than um, Prismacolor. They just go on smoother um, and you can build them up. So, you know, what you see is black and white here is a layering of a number of grays up to black and white. So that's that piece and that's the start of things. I think I'm going to, um, the first piece here that I'm starting, this is you know, the most recent piece. And I like to always start with the most recent piece because I always, for some reason, think they're the best or it still has, if I'm not finished, it still has the possibility, you know, to be that definitive work of genius. <laughs> um, this, this piece is called Weaponed Liaison uh, Church and State. Um, I've done a number of drawings based on the idea of the danger uh, or the corruption of church and state. And, you know, constantly, um, I feel like over the last four or five years, there's been a, a constant barrage of faults of trying to join, realign, or admit that we are, have a connection between church and states. Um, when you look at the work, you know, I obviously, you know, you know, I load the work. I really kind of start with an idea and I begin to look up what, what individual 
objects might mean symbolically and how that might take them to the next piece or the next piece. Um, but, and I don't expect the viewer to know that, but what I would hope the viewer uh, takes away from this, I hope they're pulled in because the imagery looks interested, interesting. I hope they're pulled in because it looks, they're abstractly interesting with the shapes and the colors and the marks. But I hope that the viewer kind of sees that, you know, there's meaning in sort of the jumble and the distortions that uh, form these cartouche um, figures. So kind of specifically in this one, uh, the, center pan the center panel um, is a wash that's done on Yupo paper. Um, and it has sort of a drawing, a linear drawing of two figures kissing or something that could be referred to as like a strand of DNA. But um, kind of fun surrounding that, if I look at the one on the left uh, with the uh, pumpkin head, uh, just to run through the symbols uh, so you know can kind of see where I go with these things. The central figure with the pumpkin head you know, is sort of a god figure or a king fig figure to me. I used the exact drawing, I stole it or appropriated it or whatever we're calling it these days um, from the original illustrations um, of John, John Neal for the original um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm dry because I just had my shot. Uh, from the original John Neal, um, Wizard, uh, Wizard of Oz, um, uh, Hank Baum's Wizard of Oz series. And you're, if, you know, you're a lot younger, so you probably might even recognize that same head. I don't think you can top it. Um, I think the, I love the expression on the face and um, just the whole feeling that it emits. Uh, younger people might recognize that very same face because Tim Burton pretty much used that as um, for Jack Pumpkinhead in the night, night be before Christmas. He hardly altered it at all. And you'll see it, I think Neil Gaiman uh, in one of his books, the illustrator uses almost the exact same uh, Jack Pumpkinhead um, uh, image. And Jack, you know, there's, if you read the story, it's not the first book of Oz, but um, it's one down the lay, uh, line and it sort of has, again, a creation story to it. Uh, the two figures, there are always pooty in cartouches. Not, I guess nothing's important unless you have little naked angels uh, floating around denoting it. But they're holding the sun and the moon, uh, which could be giving those as homage to the king or the god. Uh, but they're also about how uh, the explorers and, and people who came to steal from other countries basically used their knowledge of the sun and the moon uh, to help convert and suppress uh, the, pig, the people of other countries. And you can see the figure is sitting on um, abundance, uh, the fish. I try to bring something from earth, land, and sea into each of them. The turtle has specific uh, meanings in many cultures. He holds up the world. He is the universe. Um, if you look for me, the, um, the um, hippopotamus and the lion, I, I always remembered reading a poem by T.S. Eliot about the hippopotamus. And I thought it was a satire on the Catholic church, but it ends up it's a satire on the Church of England. And so on the other side, there's the uh, lion, which is a symbol of Eng England, and they're sitting on the Christian lamb. Okay. Uh, the next piece is called Words as Weapons, or Weaponing Words, uh, the Prosperity Gospel, Mine. Um, again, politics always weighs on my mind. Um, and just a little background story, it just, I, I think it's always been on my mind, this idea of the prosperity gospel, um, because I was accidentally listened to a radio broadcast about 20, 25 years ago, and it was a street preacher from DC who was taking care of the homeless, 
uh, in conversation with a very wealthy tele-evangelist. And I thought at the end of the, when they opened it up for questions, I thought, well, people are really going to let the televangelist, they're going to tell them off for not understanding that, you know, for really veering away from what is considered Christian values. But the opposite happened. The people began attacking the street preacher, saying, you're causing these people to be like this. They need to stand on their own feet. And it just really shocked me. And um, I realized there was... Um, something being taught that still is called the prosperity gospel, that uh, if you're good, God will reward you with lots of goodies and lots of things in this lifetime. And I was constant during, you know, catching up with old friends on Facebook, it seems like I'm constantly seeing somebody say something like, I worked for everything that I've got. And so this piece for me brings together all of the, you know, for me, um, the prosperity, you know, the, the, there are, if you look close, the center of the cartouche says mine, everything, you know, everything's mine. Um, I use Humpty Dumpty and he's appeared in a number of works um, because I think he's a really inter, not only an interesting symbol, but what an interesting visual symbol to look at. Um, my generation grew up with nursery rhymes and I don't, nursery rhymes that I don't think we knew or had any inclination of what the meanings were. I, I don't think um, the younger people here would have grown up with many nursery rhymes, but we grew up with the old Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Um, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. Um, and then Lewis, most people are familiar with Humpty Dumpty from Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass. And um, you've probably seen the Johnny Depp movie of that if you're, you're younger than me. But the um, meaning of the nursery rhyme was uh, first of all, uh, uh, Humpty Dumpty was a fat person. And way back in like 17, the 1700s, there was a big cannon that England had called Humpty Dump the Humpty Dumpty. And it actually fell off of a wall and they couldn't fix it. So that's where the rhyme came from, from that. And then Lewis Carroll may or may not have been referring to that when he came up with the Humpty Dumpty character, but uh, this is how he and John Tenniel, the illustrator, um, visualized him. And I love, and it kind of, for me, uh, comes back to the words as weapons. Humpty Dumpty says to Alice, one of the things he says, words mean exactly what I want them to mean, nothing more, nothing less. So in this one, he, you know, there's, for me, everything are specific symbols of wealth. He sits with his foot on a book, which could, is knowledge. He who, he who is in power owns the knowledge. He who is in power has the money, uh, can decide what we learn, what becomes the canon of our age. So there, again, there are very specific symbols like the beehive, the land of milk and honey of wealth. Um, the king is one of the chess pieces from Alice in Wonderland um, about manipulation. On the right is the, um, the Mad Hatter, the Mad Hatter, one of the, a laborer. And you can see in the little baskets um, on the torturees are, are little fat cannons. Oh, here we go. Um, probably missing everything here. Um, I'll go a little bit faster on these because I think you kind of have the idea now of how I put them together. Uh, but this piece is called Pinocchio Rising and um, Trickled Down. And it's sort of about that lie that comes up every, every now and then that hoax the lie that trickled down economics uh, actually works. Um, and this is, you know, to me that we weaponize uh, economics, we weaponize um, money uh, to, hurt, to hurt people. Um, in this one, um, I'm stealing from the original uh, Enrico uh, Mezzanti illustrations of uh, Colati's Pinocchio. 
And in one of the stories, Pinocchio has a dream that he comes across a money tree and he thinks that's just going to um, make the rest of his life perfect because now he's found a, a money tree. So the little, the Pinocchios there are directly, I have manipulated them before they go into the cartouche, but those are from the original um, uh, drawings. Uh, the whole piece is about, I think it's 105 by 89 inches wide. Um, what else? Let me see. I think that's it. The, the outer edges, you know, whoops, whoops. The outter edges, the black uh, funny shapes that form sort of a frame. Uh, try to refer, there we go, <laughs> refer to tree bark and um, Geppetto seeing uh, the figure of Pinocchio um, in a piece of wood and coming from there. I just, the, the little, the little guy, the figure at the bottom is also original drawing. I just love that hat uh, that Pinocchio wears. Okay, oops. Okay, um, the next piece, this piece is, uh, I guess you can see Dominion, uh, Time to Talk of Pearls. Um, and I always, in my mind, the word dominion, you know, always, uh, Rachel, I think you talk about dominion. Um, we could have exchanged some words in our, our um, artist statements, but the idea of dominion that it gets translated as having power over something always bothered me. And I said, why, you know, it's like this issue of taking care of. But this one, um, in this cartouche, I use, the, use imagery uh, once again from Lewis Carroll. I, I am obsessed with Alice in Wonderland. Um, but from the, this is from Alice Through the Looking Glass. And this is uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum uh, pause and read a poem to Alice and it's the carpenter and the walrus and there's just you know in all like all of Lewis Carroll's um, work there's a dispute over what it's about you know is it a moral story uh, did he just have a fetish for children but a uh, contemporary interpretations are you know a lot very pot you know much more positive about the interpretations um, there's some thought that this is a, a talk about a parody of capital and labor, uh, management, capital and labor. Um, and, and in a way, that's how I can see it. And if, I, I, if you don't know the poem, I won't, I won't torture you. It's a great poem. Um, I, would, I would guess that you know some of the phrases and some of the um, phrases that writers steal from time to time. But in a, in a nutshell, uh, the carpenter and the walrus are two characters and they're out for a walk and they invite the little oysters out of the sea to come take a walk with them. And they're very loving and they love the oysters and the oysters love them. But in the end, they eat them. But while they're eating them, they're crying like, you know, kind of what are we doing? Um, but um, so I think it really has a direct parallel to not only how we uh, use up labor or even how we how we use up our, our resources. And one, one of the sections I like, it says the time has come, the walrus said to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. And one of the things I thought was always missing was who gets the pearls? You know, they're getting the food, but the, the most valuable thing that was in the oyster, uh, someone else must have been getting. So for me, it's time to talk about pearls. And the shapes in all of the pieces, I'm trying to, um, you know, the abstract quality of them is really important. But in this one, um, you know, the big auxiliary piece of um, the, the black metallic piece that goes over is trying to create an arch with these two hands um, holding everything in. And the one hand for me on the black panel and the silver wash um, is sort of about the secret uh, I'm thinking about a secret quiet hand uh, that's behind everything. Uh, when it's displayed, oops, we don't have to go up. Oh, <laughs> that's so, that's, 
That's so funny. That's okay. I sh when it's displayed, um, I don't know how. These are all for a big show that's coming up for me at the um, McDonough Museum in Youngstown, Ohio. And there's like 20 foot high walls that are just gorgeous. So um, these are meant for these tw you know, 20 foot walls. So it will be up higher and, um, okay, I'm gonna go forward. Um, the pearls will hang down and I think they'll be in an even bigger puddle underneath it. Okay. Okay. Um, this piece is called Hyde's History. And um, just the simple, again, this, uh, as you see it here, it's about 100 inches high by 97 inches wide. But when it's displayed at the gallery, there's going to be another panel that rises up from um, the, center, the central point on the patterned panel. And then there'll be one that goes out about another 50 inches. So the whole thing's gonna be, um, I shouldn't say, it, it's gonna measure probably about 175 inches by you know 120 some when it when it's displayed in the in the in the gallery um and you can see again i'm using uh pinocchio um lies for me one of the hidden dangers and i think we're, we've seen it with the arguments about the confederate um statues is uh lies about history uh intentional hiding of history and you know who has the power to do that and the, the patterned panel um, is taken from dazzle patterns. And I think most people are familiar with dazzle patterns. Um, they were, artists were commissioned in World War I, in between and even during World War II to paint these really, uh, you know, pure black and white. Sometimes there's a bright color um, pattern or color thrown in there but these pure geometric crazy patterns that they painted some ba battleships with. And the idea was that, and it sounds almost counterintuitive, that when these ships were out on the ocean, if they were all together, one couldn't be distinguished from the other, this uh, one. And the dazzle pattern um, acted as a camouflage. Um, or even if it was just one ship, there was something optical that would happen that this crazy black and white pattern that's up close is so vibrant, uh, that's all you see. When it goes out into the ocean, it would blend in with, um, you know, with the waves and the crests of the waves. So that the piece, that's what the, the idea of um, hiding history um, suggested to me. All right. We just have a few more slides. Yes. Okay. Um, am I okay with time? Because uh, these will be these yeah. will be quicker. Okay. Yeah. Um, this piece. Um, this is called the spoils. Who will tell your story? And that's another thing that always is important. Who will tell our story? Who tells our 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 um, history? And it goes with the phrase. Um, you know, to the victor belongs the spoils. And one of the spoils is the victor gets to write the canon. The victor gets to cancel out the story of those who came behind. And this one sort of started right after I watched Hamilton on television, which I loved. And then I realized, you know, it was by Disney, that Disney helped produce it. And I realized there's, for me, there's some danger in that. And I know people want history given to them in a beautiful, easy way. Um, and thinking about it, you know, I've read several books about Hamilton. Um, the play and the songs make him a lot more lovable than what he was, what he actually was when you read um, biographies about him. So that's where the Mickey Mouse um, ears and um, are represented. Uh, are, are representing in this piece. And uh, the one slide is, you know, sort of, you know, the best I can do uh, mocking the installation, but it will be shown with one of these, uh, maybe one or two of these little chairs. And my idea is when, you know, the chair 
when uh, will be centered right in the pink spot where it says spoils um, and that bright um, fuchsia uh, boat will actually clash with that pink spot too. But um, the little chair is sort of a, a replica of old school chairs. So it again is working with the idea that um, to the victor belongs the spoils. Uh, that's who teaches, that's who writes our history books. Uh, the piece on the left um, is called Weaponing the Sky. Oh, there we go. Um, and again, it's about 105 by, it's probably not, I probably lied there, it's not quite 82 inches wide, but, um, you know, the Spanish were really nasty people back in, you know, the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, when they were uh, sailing to the New Worlds. And one of the things that they did to suppress the Aztecs and other um, indigenous people, um, they used their knowledge of the sky, their knowledge that either predicting an eclipse or the knowledge of what an eclipse was, to suppress, um, to scare the indigenous people uh, and, and to say our God's better, our God's bigger than your God. Um, our God can, and it's probably, he can do this. Um, and so this piece is sort of a, for me, a replica of an eclipse and the small uh, triangular piece has uh, imagery uh, from astronomy, um, just some of the instruments and some of the symbols from that. Okay, that's the last of those. And I wanted to show the collages. And I want to say that those were, there are several, there are more of these uh, larger pieces. And if this was a long lecture, I would show you failures. Uh, some of the pieces that are real, you know, I would consider real failures because I think they're important too, but uh, yeah, you want to look good in a short lecture. So, um, but one of the things I do, and um, when I do the big pieces, I do about, I'll follow them up with like three to five small collages of different, um, uh, just trying something different with the imagery that I had already made. And um, what I do is I, I start with, um, you know, my documentation and I bring that into Photoshop and I change colors and sometimes I uh, distort it in different ways and then do a number of collages. And what I, I mean, it really helps me A, relax and move on to the next piece. Uh, it makes me see things in a slightly different way. Um, I might use colors, um, shapes in a different way. Um, and, and working with the collages, uh, that's what really led me to do the shaped pieces. And I spent about a year, two years, and I think most of the original shaped pieces were failures. And I felt like I, it, the first time, and you know, really took me a while to get them off the ground. But you can see the titles, The Spoils, Who Will Tell Your Story. Um, I just, I've done several of these, the history of greed, uh, stigmata. Um, and like I said, here's like two that can you know, come from one, you know, the, the Pinocchio rising piece, uh, just changing the colors to see how that affects something, bringing another element into it. Um, I have, you know, there's probably about four more of these and the collages range from, you know, about six inches by four inches, you know, on up to the 30 by 40. If, if you want to see more of them, they're on my website. Um, okay. Uh, this is from the spoils. I think this is an eight by eight. And I th that Mickey Mouse in the center of the cartouche was originally going to go on the big one. Um, but it was just, it was overkill. So uh, it ended up here. Okay. Uh, second version of his hiding history. That one's probably about 13 by 14. Um, a lot of them get, you know, have a little bit more elaborate painting on them. Uh, most ones I, I brought up here don't, but this is mapping. Uh, robbing Peter, uh, mapping, when you read about mapping, uh, it's used as a weapon. 
Um, so that that's that's what followed. This is mapping robbing Peter too. And I think that's the, oh, I have one more and one more collage, esoteric knowledge. So um, I couldn't find, I think I know where a whole portfolio of prints are uh, that I did at Edinburgh. And, and that was my primary focus was lithography. Um, and I think it's bare, they're buried behind a whole stack of paintings. But I found that a slide of this uh, one piece on the right, the linear piece, the, uh, the female figure. And I was glad I have it because it's a, if this was a pivotal piece for me uh, when I was at Edinburgh. I, I was always the kid who could draw. Um, I could draw realistically. I drew in perspective um, when I was three and four years old. So that was part of my identity. So even though I respected and tried different ways of drawing, it was hard for me to completely let go of um, realistic drawing to some extent. And I looked around and believe me, you may think it, but I think I was at Edinburgh during a golden age. I was there uh, 71 through um, 75. And there were just some incredibly, incredibly talented students there. And, and I was super, lucky to be around them and they kind of pushed me and kept you know I think I learned quite a bit from them they were great teachers um a lot more of us there we were a really big class um the numbers began to dwindle so anyhow I looked around and there were a lot of people doing what I thought were much more powerful works and I thought I've really got to think about this a lot more this is really important to me. And so I started drawing upon um, ideas that I was working with in other classes, like uh, uh, art education courses um, that, you know, the first thing kids do when they draw in the air is the search for the circle, the mad search for the circle. And, that, and that's what this piece sort of reflected. Um, I think this piece uh, on the right may have been like right out of Edinburgh or right at the end, just, um, you know, because I still loved working realistically and I got into a gallery and they were selling them, which was a good thing and a bad thing. They sold about everyone I wanted uh, that I sent to them, which was good for me at that time. But it also, I think, was too early for me to decide, you know, it just, it held me back like other things needed to happen in the work. So I, I, things that I, I wish I could find, I was working with the architectural elements, those keep coming back into the work, but someday I'll find those. So um, I think that's the last of my slides. It, it is, and thank okay. you. And uh, just uh, quickly, Pat, this, I love it that you did show work from your time at Edinburgh. Um, the one on the right, is this, is this all drawing? Is this photography, collage? No, it's all drawing. Um, it's probably about a 60 inch square. If things are life size um, and it's mixed media. It's not quite so golden as that, um, but it's mixed media paint um, and graphite and colored pencil on real heavy paper. Wow. So. wow. Great. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and just go back into regular mode here before we transition to Rachel. And um, I, oh, Lisa, I, I was just looking at Lisa's question. Uh, so what we can do is uh, we'll take time now for Rachel to share her presentation. And I'm going to exit out of and Rachel, did you want me to share my screen or did you want to? Sh I want to, I want to share my, my screen. Go ahead. Ah. Hello. All right. The floor is yours, Rachel. Isn't it odd that we as a society decide that other species are inherently inferior to humans? My name is Rachel Malley. I'm a sculptor and writer 
who works to challenge the prevailing anthropocentric ideology about animals. Within my art, I've been creating a mythology with the intent to disrupt the tradition of anthropocentrism and lead to better treatment of animals by weaving a narrative that elevates them as sentient beings who possess power and efficacy. Dominion and human superiority over nature is mythologized in our culture, ordained as our right as humans. These ideas are part of the larger narratives our society tells and upholds in every form of expression and communication and has been doing so for thousands of years. The most prevalent overarching myth about nature is that it is all here for us humans. This myth has more iterations that I can count or discuss. Myths are either a magical story or a commonly held belief that society holds to be true, such as the belief that chickens live on grassy open farms like in this Edgar Hunt painting, not the reality of the overcrowded factory farm where about 9 billion chickens are raised in deplorable living conditions and killed every year in the United States for meat. It is remarkable that for all of our dependence on this animal, how dismissive our attitudes are towards it. Over the past several years, I've been researching and responding to the realities and mythologies surrounding the chicken. I've yet to find a single serious depiction of the chicken where the chicken was representative of itself and not symbolic of something else. I'm compelled to treat the chicken as a serious subject unto itself. I've been focusing on presenting the consciousness of chickens through mythology where chicken human interaction with the piece empowers or honors the chicken, subverting the human chicken power dynamic. I'm interested in using the beauty, strangeness, and mystery of these objects to entice the viewer to consider the, the consciousness of chickens and the often unpalatable subject matter of the mass abuse and consumption of these animals. The throne monumentalizes and demands respect for the chicken, dispelling the notion that this animal is silly, dumb, or cowardly. The sitter is held up by the chicken, but simultaneously relinquishes their own power when they sit in the claw. The chicken wields power over the viewer, overturning the human chicken power dynamic. The offering bowl for the souls of dead chickens asks the viewer to give an offering to the deceased birds. When a person gives of themselves to the soul, they blur or dissolve the hierarchy by in that moment, establishing the chicken as worthy of respect or as an equal. The truth of the lives and death of these animals is often one that many do not wish to consider. Mm -hmm. The disposability of the chicken is reflected in that the bones of these animals are trash items. We bury the bones of our own species and sometimes those of pets, but not those of chickens. So I started collecting these discarded chicken bones and to find a way to challenge the view of the chicken as disposable. Uh, first piece in involving the discarded bone is the sarcophagus, which houses a single bone. The bone lays in a nest of natural items that the chicken probably never experienced in their short life. The bone is honored with burial, marking the animal as someone rather than as a something. I use the discarded bone in my work and render it into an object of veneration and communication in my machines for communicating with the souls of dead chickens. These machines all have similar components. Each have copper conductors that hold the bone and conduct the sole of the chicken to the earpiece. The machines work as such. A chicken bone is placed in a critical location in this machine, allowing for the chicken to communicate on their own terms with the viewer. The viewer is in turn invited to transcend the anthropocentric view of the chicken. When the viewer imagines using this machine, they must consider what it could mean to have the capacity to hear a dead chicken, especially one that was slaughtered to be eaten. The viewer must then reconsider their own potential use of the chicken and the human chicken relationship. My newest machine is modeled after an old, old rotary wall phone. Instead of numbers on a dial, a single chicken bone is held in the center of this machine. Copper conductors allow the soul of the dead chicken to communicate from the bone through the handset directly to the ear of the listener. The closed beak on the handset 
refuses to provide a receptacle for the human voice, indicating that this machine is intended for one-way communication. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. Should I, should I stop screen sharing? Yes, if you don't mind, that'd be great. All right. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're, um, I'm just gonna ask a couple of questions and then, um, and then also people feel free to put them in the chat or we can also just, you know, speak without putting things in the chat as well. Lisa, um, I wanted to just kind of go to your, a few of your comments and questions that you asked. Um, this is for uh, Pat. Uh, Lisa had asked uh, if you could share some of the names of your fellow Edinburgh students and, and teachers from the 70s. Um, okay. Uh, Tony Booba, uh, the filmmaker, was there to, um, when I was at Edinburgh, although he was a psychology uh, major, but uh, I don't know if other, if the, uh, the younger crew's familiar with Tony, but he's an incredibly well known um, independent filmmaker. Um, I'm trying to think, an excellent painter, um, Robert Robinson, who still lives in Pittsburgh, um, Bill Godfrey, who is in Pittsburgh, and he became well known for. Um, doing uh, banners and working with different communities. Um, geez, here I go. Uh, so, uh, incredible artist who just uh, who just died, Jay Flory. Uh, these are people that really had an effect on me. Uh, my um, printmaking teacher that I worked closest with was Tony Coe. Um, uh, James Vredervoog was still there and he, he um, he had a really uh, big influence on me. Um, he was considered a painting and drawing teacher, but I think he really introduced the vocabulary of, of happenings and performances, um, you know, back in, you know, 70s. And um, I think he, you know, he started the program he was sort of running, I think it's very much like what a lot of schools have gone to since the 90s. I think uh, Edinburgh changed it back since then. Um, I always wanted to say one of the first shows I saw when I got to Edinburgh, which, uh, you know, was outstanding. I think it was in the Bates Gallery. That was the only gallery. It was before Doucette Hall. It was uh, the first time I saw um, graphic novels and cartoonists and comic book artists come together as a show and being said, this is fine arts too. So um, they had the works of Moskosko um, and who's the famous, R. Crumb. Uh, it was just this really wonderful, crazy show. So um, I just was always grateful that Edinburgh brought that into the conversation early on. And then also, uh, Pat, if you could just share some of, um, you know, the aspects of, you know, coming out of uh, Edinburgh, and then you, you had mentioned about how uh, you had to go and a lot of your work had sold. So if you could just talk a little bit about um, some of the impacts, both successful and um, unsuccessful impacts of um, having, um, work sold at such a young age. And you had said that you wish you would have kept some of those works as well. So just some lessons learned. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the things I always laughed at, and that one sh the slide that I showed you um, of the, the woman in the square, I always used it as how not to take documentation. Cause we never talked about, we, you know, if you wanted to learn how to document your work, go learn how to document your work. So it was the bigger slide. It's the piece on my, my father's old garage. There's one where I'm using pole lamps, old fashioned pole lamps. So I left, the, you know, we kind of left there not knowing how to, you know, in a good way and in a bad way, how do you contact a gallery? What do you do? How do you get your work together? Uh, there was help in applying for grad schools. Uh, so that was great. Um, I think on that order, I actually wrote down a few things um, that I, you know, I would 
you know, unsolicited advice, but maybe that comes through there. Um, you know, your question, Kikolo, uh, uh, one of the, the, an overriding thing that's meant a lot to me um, was the statement that James Vriederhood made when I was at Edinburgh. Um, and he said, separate the artist from the student. This is sort of a number one layer of it, uh, line of advice that I would give people. Uh, separate the artist from the student and do it now. If you can do it when you're a freshman, when you, if you can do it when you're a sophomore, start doing it. If you're studying medicine or nursing, you're not gonna be a nurse till you leave Edinburgh. You're not gonna be a nurse, but you can start thinking and being an artist now. And the one of the things is the student says, what's the assignment? How do I get an A? Um, and, and they do that. But an artist is like, okay, what's the assignment? I understand what the prof is trying to get across, but how do I make it mine? How do I make it better? Um, this, and the student works, I'm sorry, the artist works, that it's more than making an assignment. Um, other advice, I think, um, and, and you're probably all better at this than I was, but learn to pursue dialogue. Uh, talk with your professors. Think of them as people that are your co-conspirators in, in making your work and making you a better artist. Um, talk with each other. Uh, students, you're your best assets. Um, and, and then learn, learn how to approach dialogue, make dialogue, ask for dialogue, and then learn how to sort. And it's easy to say, eh, I heard what he said, heard what she said, I don't want to do it. And it's also easy to say, yeah, I heard what he said, I heard what she said, I'm going to do it. So you've got to find the ability to sort through advice to, um, to apply for, you know, to the, your needs. And I think that's one of the toughest things for a student. Uh, learn how to write. We didn't write a lot. Um, not, I know Rachel, you are a writer, so who asked, I don't have to tell you that, but um, I think even if it's just taking notes, it really can help to clarify. It helps to be able to talk about your work because how you talk about your work should be different than how I talk about my work. And especially people who work in an abstract notion, they think they should have a story. You know, I have stories because that's what my work is based on. But I think it's so important to say, I'm an abstract artist and it's important for me, you know, if I put orange next to gray, I want to make colors vibrate. I want to do this. Learn how to clarify, at least for the time being, what you think you're doing. And I think it really helps the work. Um, take your academics seriously. Um, I was, you know, my, ac I didn't have any problems with academics, but I would have worked harder. I kind of almost blew, you know, a physical science class. I wish I would have paid closer attention. I wasn't an artist in there. I was a student. Do How can I pass it? But all of that stuff can be applied to your work. And think about what academics, if you have electives, what academics are going to support your work um, and try to arrange them um, so that they do. What are you interested in? Geographies, uh, biology, line them up to support your work. And, and more than anything, you know, work, just work. Um, if you can put together, you know, and we're all different. I had to work when I was at, uh, at Edinburgh. I had a job um, outside of being in the classroom. Um, so that took up time. But for me, it was like more important and to be in Loveland Hall uh, over the weekends because that's when you know, I had unbroken time and when ideas started flowing. It was also when the best parties were too because the ceramics department really had great parties back then. So there was a great um, camaraderie of, of a group, not everybody, a very small group of students that really cared deeply about art. And if there isn't one, make one. And you know, and I just had a friend, you know, a friend of mine came came home, graduated from Chicago Art Institute, 
And she came back to Pittsburgh and she was gonna leave because there wasn't a community. And her mother said, hey, baby girl, make that community. And, she, and she's made one of the best communities for artists in Pittsburgh. So that, that would be some of my unsolicited advice to you. And, and get a backbone. You know, uh, that was one of the things that I saw at my time, my time at Edinburgh was there were a lot of talented people. And because most of us, if not all of us were working class, we didn't have chutzpah or we didn't have a backbone. And so it was always clear to me because I did work with, you know, students at Carnegie Mellon that came from more privileged backgrounds and they were good. They weren't, you know, but they weren't necessarily better than, than people that I worked with at Edinburgh. Some of the best people quit working once they left there. So get a backbone. Rachel, help them out if you have a, any extra bones around. So. Wow, that, that's just some tremendous insight. Uh, thank you so much, Pat, for sharing that. And, and Rachel, I wanna uh, engage you in this as well. Uh, I wanna talk about a little bit about your process. Um, you know, um, and looking at this work, um, can you tell us a little bit about your process and putting these things together? Because it's a lot of, there's these sculptural elements into these installations that you put. So can you talk a little bit about your process? I use a lot of different materials. Mm -hmm. I'm, I, I can't say, I can't say I use everything, but I use a lot, many, many different materials. So I have, I've been working in metals like um, copper and uh, that, that foam, the last piece was, is made of car carved foam and spackling paste. So I'm, I use a combination of fabrication, metal forming, modeling, carving. And then how do you even determine like the scale, the size of your work? It usually, sometimes it's sometimes it's just conceptual with my my machines. Some the ones that resemble phones, mm -hmm. they're 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 chosen to be more more or less phone scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, then, but yeah, their scale is scale is often scale ranges immensely. I can see that. Yes, you, you have these chicken claws that are enormous, you know, and then you have, you know, a size of like, you know, the phone, this, this um, kind of older version of, 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 of a dial up phone system. Um, and it's interesting, somebody your age incorporating something, you know, as some, some people your age would say, what is that? That's a, that, that, that's, we've never even seen that before. So I thought that was really unusual. Interesting that you 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 created you integrated this these you know animals into this communication device into this older communication device. And then um, Pat, lastly, before I open up to anybody else asking questions as well, um, with your process, there was a question about um, the type of paper that you use. Do you work on uh, Yupo? Paper, am I pronouncing it correctly? Is it Yupo? It's Yupo, yeah. Yupo. Okay. Yupo. And then do you affix it to the birch? Like how, how do you incorporate that? Into um, I have some visual aids. <laughs> so what we do, um, my husband's a retired school teacher, but he's also an excellent carpenter. And so um, we build the forms. Um, and this is a small one to give you an idea of kind of the, of the thickness of them or, you know, like that. And they're built like a square canvas stretcher, but, you know, we have to curve um, the edges and stuff. So um, the front is what I say is, is birch plywood. And then um, this one I sanded the washes off of, um, but that's prepared with, um, house paint and then you can see in the back they're counter painted with house paint so they don't warp, warp we use it goes this way I don't know if, if you know the um 
I'm really getting detailed here, but this is, we hang them, build them with a cleat to hang them from, but it's also part of the structure. So that's the basis for the drawings. Um, when I use, um, and then I was, what we do for the curved ones now is there's this stuff called wiggle board and it comes in like a four by eight foot sheet like um, any plywood and uh, but it wiggles and you can you can curve it and we instead of like the solid pieces of wood we run this around the uh under the plywood and then staple it and so that's how we do the curved edges um is that yeah. it's pretty clear huh with the oh, yeah well that's very detailed i mean it's very malleable mm -hmm. um and then you know, when I do some of the applications, um, the UFO paper, I don't have any. Um, it's a synthetic, um, it's a synthetic paper and it comes, uh, you can get it in sort of an opaque white or a translucent white. And I like the translucents. And the, for me, the beauty of it is you can do washes on it. Uh, it doesn't warp. Um, you can sand it, you can draw on it. So that's how some, you know, a couple of the pieces have the center area um, with washes or markings on UFO paper uh, placed on it. And that's what I use um, on a lot of, you know, when I'm doing some of the collages. Um, where's there? So you can, that formed a ground for that one. So it's kind of a, it's supposed to be archival um, it will probably outlive me. So, you know, so that's a good thing there. Um, and then I was just gonna, I'll show you very quickly what these, I could I probably should have made them into a slide. This is what um, the, the one piece, church and state, they, they, I start on Photoshop and this is, you know, this is kind of where it starts. Um, the one with the Jack, the pumpkin head. And I put together all of the architectural elements to form a frame. And then one by one, I start adding all of the other elements. And then I take this and then it gets distorted and twisted um, into a shape that I like. And then I take that to Kinko's and blow it up real big and trace that um, onto the panel. And you could see in the piece, the spoils, I liked how those lines looked, so I left them there. So, um, too much information, but you know, in case you're curious. No, I don't think so. I think people really liked how detailed you were about that. Um, uh, another question, and I think we'll take one more before we wrap up. Uh, uh, so, the title of this uh, this series, this 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 event, um, is entitled "Our Fellow Beings," and so. It would be great to hear Pat and Rachel talk about uh, the use of animals in your work, um, both mythical and real. Um, could you just speak a little bit about um, incorporating animals and why animals and, and how do they play a role in your art making? Rachel? Um, so I'm, I'm really, I, spend a lot of time looking at animal rights and environmental related issues and the, all the abuses animals face in, all, in so many arenas of, of human society from factory farms, which I talked about and just uh, entertainment Animal, uh, animals in, in lab in, in experiments, and also animals in, in the wild whose habitats and home environments are being destroyed, and how this has been upheld over time. I, I'm usually I'm inspired to create works relating to protecting these animals wanting to get people to think differently about them and our relationship to individual animals and then animals at, at, at large. I think, you know, for me, I think um, 
it is the connection to symbols um, and studying symbols and uh, animals seem to be the predominant thing when you look at um, really begin to study um, symbols from different cultures and religions and times and um, you know they get kind of if you pick up a Christian handbook of, of symbols it gets so detailed that it almost becomes funny like you know it isn't just a bird means something it's the meadow alert means something so I really like that uh, so I saw they're very important um, to storytelling um, I, you know, I really like animals and I, you know, probably the last line of my um, artist statement was, is, hey, with everything said, maybe I just like to draw animals. So it kind of comes back um, to something that's that simple, maybe. And I want to know, Rachel, why didn't you show the rabbit piece? I love the rabbit piece, the one with the dirt rabbits. I actually, I, I actually originally had it in the presentation. Uh -huh. And then it was I was urged to I was uh, I to make it all to make it more concise. I was concerned I'd be going through all the images way too quickly. Mm -hmm. So it was it was very it was very very close. Oh, <laughs> so I really want I want to keep it in there, but I feel like oh, is it, are we going to go through the images too quickly? Yeah. Well, next time, Rachel, you trust trust your gut and 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 keep it in there. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think about like animals and how for most people, you know, are some of our first, you know, memories are of animals, whether you have pets or, you know, storytelling, nursery rhymes, books. I mean, those are kind of some of our first memories are of, of animals. And I also look at both of your works of, of how they serve as these cautionary tales. Um, and how bringing in these kind of political and these socioeconomics into, you know, the way in which you pull in, you know, uh, the symbols of animals. And uh, I find them very, very compelling and that you both have these different perspectives of integrating animals, but in a very powerful way, very compelling way. So I thought this was really, really wonderful to be able to have, you know, uh, um, a younger artist with an older artist that both can kind of learn from each other and inform each other in their practices. Uh, and so I also wanted to thank you, Lisa, for putting in to the chat um, for more information about this series. Uh, you can go to brucegallery.info to learn more about future, um, future events. But then also, I, I know, Pat, this is just scratching the surface about your work, and I'm sure that Edinburgh is going to want to have you back in the future because you are just a tremendous asset, not for Edinburgh, not only to Edinburgh, but to the greater Pittsburgh region, um, all of your just contributions. Um, I didn't go to CMU, but you are like a legend. <laughs> so, oh <my> God. <laughs> you know what they say about history and legend. <laughs> Oh my yeah, God. yeah. And, and so I've heard, I know friends who have you know taken classes and people that have been able to take classes and I just think that Edinburgh also is this kind of kept secret too. It's a uh, secret, it's, yeah. It's a hidden gem, mm -hmm. it's a hidden gem, and more people need to know about it. Um, but I also just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening, and uh, I love it how Lisa's feeding these little inf bits of information. <laughs> Uh, our um, upcoming event is uh, April 14th with the photographer Steve Plattner. We also have another event, April 21st, which is going to be about uh, the photographer Kathy Kowalski, and we'll be in conversation with some wonderful people. But also just please, uh, uh, for more information, you can uh, go to brucegallery.info. Is there anything else, uh, Lisa? Did you want to say parting words? before we end? And if anybody else wanted okay, to- I was gonna say, I want to ask a question. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just, just something technical. Yeah. Um, I was really, uh, I have some big pieces of four by eight that I'm about to start painting on or do something with them. Um, and then you mentioned that you would use household paint to prep them and then use oil-based pencils to draw on them. Yeah. I was curious if you could just go into more, well, 
what, like, what other materials were you using um, when you were doing that? And what more materials were you trying to avoid given, you know, the substrate that you were working on? And I just want to interject, um, Anthony, can you share with Pat what kind of work you do? Oh, uh, I'm like, I, I'm still in the midst of uh, putting a name on what I do. It's kind of like an abstract expressionist um, conceptual kind of thing that I'm doing. Um, I think to go anything, to go any further, I think I'd start stumbling on my words, but um, that's coming soon. But um, I'm studying printmaking here and I'm a first year right now in the master's program. Um, what's your, do you have a, a focus in printmaking or do you do? And Palio is my uh, main suit. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was probably the, we didn't have as, the facilities for Intaglio weren't as good as the litho uh, facilities when I was there, so. Yeah, we definitely have a lot of litho stones and a lot of litho presses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but, um, uh, yeah. yeah, are are you in the, you're in your studio right now. Um, if you could send me a link, I'd love to see your work. So if if you yeah. have anything online, so that, that would be a great thing. You can get my info from Lisa or uh, Kilolo. Um, yeah, I'd love but, to. Yeah, uh, the birch is, you know, pretty much, you know, I use the birch because it has the tightest grain, but yeah. you always have to check, you know, I get it at Lowe's. I, I don't usually go in Home Depot, but Lowe's, um, and the best is Baltic birch, but you can only get like 60 by 60 in that. But sometimes I have to go to oak. It just, you have to check it every time you're there to see what's the best quality because it changes so much. Uh, the first big piece that I showed you with the three panels, they don't even have a stretcher strip on the back. They're just flat birch, you know, quarter inch. If that was any heavier, I couldn't lift them. Uh, and most of my work up until I did the, um, started the shaped pieces, I was just doing on the flat birch, nothing. And they do warp a little bit. So it's important to do a couple paint, uh, coats of paint on the back. And I get, if they have like the $5 cans of house paint at Lowe's, I grab those and keep those because uh, it doesn't matter to me what the back is. And then the front, I use the, you know, the premium, bare um I, flat because has a little bit of a grain uh, yeah. it's not as rubbery as uh gesso acrylic gesso is like rubber to me so yeah. you know the washes will warp them but i don't you know i don't really care and they i screw them right to the wall we used to make frames but it was like cutting the edges off too sharp um, yeah uh, you know, I get kind of a roughly edge and I kind of, then it would get too, I don't know, harsh for the drawing. So I just put screws all the way around that holds them flat. And sometimes I just screw, I'll find if that, I'll just screw right into the drawing to hold them to the wall, to, you know, right through it, I'll find a spot that won't show. Um, and then, then that shocks the installers that, um, you know, I'm not treating them like a religious object. So, but, yeah. you know, I, 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 like I said, I like the oil-based um, pencils. I think they're about the same price. I get them through Dick Blick in massive quantities. Um, they go on better and they don't get, uh, if you build up Prismacolor, you get sort of a funny sheen. Um, okay. And I'm also, you know, it's, I also think, and somebody could do experimenting, I think those oil-based uh, pencils would work on a litho stone. Uh, you know, yeah, I, haven't I, a, yeah, I haven't done a litho for a long time, but, um, you know, the fun, you know, the, I just, I showed you how the, um, the um, panels are made for the shaped pieces and warping's the problem there. So on those bigger ones, we have like three cleats on them now. So they hold themselves, that's what holds them flat to the wall. Okay. I was just most concerned with, um, so like you're doing these washes, you're watering down the acrylic and then just going mm -hmm. straight on and you're not having any issues with it chipping or uh, like when you're layering, having a weird uh, no. thing happening with it. Mm -mm. Never no. have. 
No, I think I think I had problems once because somebody told me the best stuff to use was the cheapest stuff, uh, the cheapest paint at Home Depot or at Lowe's, and the yeah. edge chipped. But uh, that I really haven't had chipping or, you know, I think the washes add to the warping. Uh, yeah, the main problem, and it's just trying to figure out how to keep them straight. Or um, so. Pat, so but, ha Oh, I was just gonna... I was say, uh, uh, Anthony, uh, one of your uh, examples of your work is in the background of. Wayne. Oh, there's, there's, there's Bill. Bill <laughs> hanging, hanging in the. Ah, uh, uh, a shout out if you didn't Bill, want to show your work. It. Yeah. He, well, well a, take I'd some clips here. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see more. Yeah, so, no, of course. I gotta. I'm in the midst of scanning stuff right now and trying to get it all online. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, do you use anything that wasn't oil based or acrylic based when you're like pencils, pens? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll use um, oil pastels or, but I, you know, really kind of, you know, I predominantly painted uh, for a long time too. And then I shifted to drawing um, about 10 years ago because I liked, I liked the directness of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I had an Edinburgh professor once said, you know, even when you paint, you draw. And I thought, oh my God, that's bad. But maybe it was a, you know, and I, I should have asked, what do you, what do you mean by that? But I thought it was a bad thing, but yeah. um, I've really clean, you know, cleaned them down. I don't know, some of, none of them there, you know, I stick things on them. Like, you know, there's one I didn't show that has toy, toy Mickey Mouses on it and, yeah. uh, you know, one might get all these plastic tulips and stuff, but um, I'm not against you, you know, anything else going on. And it just was really nice to pare down. So. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I was also thinking about I, I collect like, I think I've been collecting movie tickets since I was in middle school, elementary school. Uh, on top of some other things I've collected and I've been saving for a collage and I was thinking about possibly integrating it into one of the panels. And since you just said that, I might have to, um, but thank you. Live it up, now, you know, yeah, now's, the, now's the time to do it. I was yeah. gonna point out in my background and I just, this wasn't, I didn't do this on purpose. I own these, uh, I don't know if Jonathan Trueblood's still teaching um, animation I know everything shifted, but uh, Jonathan was teaching animation at Edinburgh for a while. Uh, and he was a grad student at Carnegie Mellon and I, I bought a suite of his drawings. So that's, that's, what, that's what's behind me, so. Uh, it's hard to see, but I'm sure they're uh, amazing. Yeah, they're, they're in a bat, they are. They're really beautiful and smart little pieces, so. Yeah, yeah no, I, I have a hard appreciation for cartoon work. I, I thought of an original um, Tom and Jerry uh, caricature uh -huh. that my aunt, who was an artist, gave to me when I was a baby. And it's probably my most prized possession. Love that oh, thing. Treasure that. Yeah. 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 But thank you. Thank you for asking my question. That was, that was yeah, really helpful. You, same thing. If you, you get my, you can ask me uh, if I know the answer, how, you know, you can email me and I'll help out or lie or pretend I do or something so yeah no, I'm, I'm sure we'll be in contact I appreciate that so. okay Thanks. this is Lisa I just want to jump in and say that uh Anthony will be uh sharing some of his work what is the date the 28th uh on April 28th he's going to be part of the presentation uh so um anybody who's interested in hearing more from Anthony there's your opportunity and I don't want to lose the chance to uh, give a shout out to Bill Maffey uh, and ask Bill, is there anything going on that we should, would not about Egress Press? Just tell us what's happening. Uh, uh, we, we are working with an artist who's here at Erie Arts and Culture. Um, and Kat Charnley is on, the, on this too. She's working with him. Uh, and uh, Carl, what's Carl's whole name? <laughs> just met the other day uh, let me pull it up real quick but we just started in on we talked with him and he's drawing on some uh some mylars uh and then we're going to shoot uh, and do some photolitho uh, five color photolitho so he's he'll be in the studio and you know people can check out what he's doing 
His name is Carl Joe Williams. Um, so that's actually the name of his website also, carljoewilliams.com. He's an artist from New Orleans, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, New Orleans. And uh, he's up here for the month of April. So uh, uh, it's a nice opportunity for us. Normally with egress lately, we've tried to give artists an honorarium and help them out. And Erie Arts and Culture is covering that. So, uh, oh. yeah, he's got some interesting work. Um, he seems like a super nice guy. So we're excited to see where it'll go. We've only just begun working with him. So we'll see what kind of image we build or he oh, built. Great. Um, Bill, what do you have in your background now? Oh, that's cats. Cat Charlie, that's one of her pieces. I, I put up Ferris's, so I had to put up one of Cat's. Our two yeah, grad I, students in printmaking right now. So I, I thought it was really interesting. I didn't, I wasn't really aware of what today's presentation was about. I just kind of heard about it last minute and I heard printmakers, so I hopped on. Um, and then to hear you and Rachel talk about animals, I was like, oh, okay, this is like right yeah. up my alley too. So I work, I work with a lot of like figures and animals and figures with animal heads, um, largely in a domestic setting. Um, yeah, with, I do a lot of intaglio and lithography lately. So yeah, it's a good time. If I can disappear out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, when I disappear, it wants to show something else. Yeah. But if I move back far enough, maybe I can see where I can sit on the couch or I can um I can pop my website in the chat if you are interested in my image. Hold on a second. Thanks. That's it. We got it. Cool. All right, wonderful. And I know Lisa, um, you have a, you have the con you have contact information for Pat, so you can share that with uh, the students that are um, on this uh, on this webinar this evening. That would be fantastic. All righty, so I think we should wrap up. This was fantastic, and I know Pat. This is once again. I just say we're just scratching the surface with your work, and then just you know, um, you know, engaging you in this this conversation. And it's just I I just love as a curator to be able to um, engage um, intergenerations of artists mm -hmm. and having them in dialogue. And this is just such a great opportunity for all of us to learn from one another. And I love printmaking. I'm not a printmaker, that's why I'm a curator, but I've taken printmaking classes in the past and I know how you know, very meticulous it can be. So uh, I um, really applaud the work that the students are doing. And so I just wanted to say thank you everyone for joining us and um, stay tuned for our next um, event, which is April 14th with photographer Steve Plattner. And for more information, you can go to brucegallery.info. Uh, so um, have a great evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. 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 Thank you